In Ephesians 6 verse 12, Paul introduces the spiritual mafia, the forces of chaos. As John Ramirez says, quote, You cannot negotiate with the enemy of your soul. Stop compromising and making peace with him. All he understands is violence, end quote. And that's what we're going to be looking at today in our study is Ephesians 6 verse 12, in which Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. So the first thing we notice is Paul says we do not wrestle. And scholars debate the reason Paul used the term wrestle instead of a term for warfare. But Plato and Philo both mix metaphors of sport and war. So Paul is not unique in his use of mixed metaphors. The Greek philosopher and historian Plutarch said that a fully armed soldier who was also a trained wrestler had an advantage in battle. And Harold Honer commenting on this, he says, quote, the fully armed soldier was an accomplished wrestler who on occasion would be involved in close quarter struggle against a cunning opponent. Due to the cunning schemes of the devil, believers need to be ready for both remote and close at hand assaults, end quote. And Marcus Barth believes that Paul's use of the term wrestle dispels the idea that a Christian can engage in battle against evil as if from the safe distance of a B-52 bomber. Rather, he stands in hand-to-hand -hand combat and bears the corresponding risks. And scholars also note that the literal order of the words in Greek are blood and flesh. Now, in most all of the English translations, it's going to say we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But the, the literal order in Greek reads blood and flesh. And very few English translations, again, pick up on this nuance. And scholars themselves aren't sure of the significance of the word order reversal. As Barth notes, a reason why the formula flesh and blood is reversed here has not yet been found. So I just wanted to point that out because that is the way that it's uh, worded in the Greek text, blood and flesh. Um, but the scholars just, they are not sure why, um, what the reasoning is that Paul had for, for, uh, phrasing it that way rather than the usual uh, flesh and blood. Uh, that brings us to what's going to uh, comprise the bulk of our study today, and that's Paul's famous naming of this evil spiritual hierarchy, the spiritual mafia. Uh, the Dictionary of Deities and Demons actually has three entries on these terms. Uh, archon, which is the word translated rulers. Exousia, which is the authorities, and cosmocrater, which is the cosmic powers. And Clinton Arnold says, quote, the terminology Paul uses here for these, for these spirits is suggestive of hierarchy in the demonic realm, end quote. So our spiritual battle is against the spiritual mafia. And I'm going to go through the Dictionary of Deities and Demons entries for these terms. Um... And as I said, that will comprise the bulk of what we're talking about today because that's really what the verse is about, as Paul is naming these entities and laying it out in a hierarchical structure. So first up is the term archon. And the entry written in the deity, uh, Dictionary of Deities and Demons uh, for this term was done by David Ahn, who, just if anybody out there is familiar with him, he's the scholar that wrote the three-volume commentary on the book of Revelation in the Word Biblical series. So I thought that was pretty interesting that, uh, that he's the scholar that wrote this entry for Archon in the DDD. So Archon carries the root meaning of primacy in time or rank. And during the late Hellenistic and early Roman period, the term Archon in both singular and plural forms began to be used in early Judaism and early Christianity, and then in Neoplatonism and Gnosticism as designations for supernatural beings, such as angels, demons, and Satan, as well as planetary deities who were thought to occupy a particular rank in a hierarchy of supernatural beings, analogous to a political or military structure. And so what Paul is giving us here is the hierarchical military structure of the dark side. 
There was a widespread notion in the ancient world that the planets either were deities or were presided over by deities. We discussed this idea in our study of the elemental spirits um, in the lecture titled Christus Victor and also uh, a clip from that that I posted titled Elemental Spirits and New Age Spirituality. And we discussed this idea that uh, the ancients believed that the planets were either deities or presided over by deities. In early Judaism and early Christianity, Archon was one of the designations used to refer to the evil spiritual ruler of human beings and the cosmos. So that's the end of the DDV section on Archon. The next one up is authorities. Again, the Greek word is exousia. And this term denotes celestial forces. And the DDD, Dictionary of Deities and Demons, points out there are no antecedents for the New Testament usage of exousia in the Septuagint or other pre-Christian Hellenistic texts. So the origin must be sought in apocalyp apocalyptic literature. And then they give uh, First and Second Enoch, Assumption of Isaiah, Testament of Levi, the Apocaly Apocalypse of Baruch, the Testament of Abraham, and the Testament of Solomon as examples for where this term exousia is used in a similar way to how Paul is using it in Ephesians 6. And 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24 speaks of the eschatological destruction of all celestial entities as part of the completion of the kingdom of God. And these entities can also be categorized as the celestials located in the middle ranges of the cosmos. As the lists of celestial beings indicate, they are many in number. Presumably, they possess their authority from primordial times when the Creator bestowed it upon them. But, since they became evil and demonic, the Redeemer had to subdue them. This happened after His resurrection when Christ ascended into heaven and took His place at the right side of God. Christ's enthronement may also be the reason why their names were withheld. God so exalted Christ that He gave Him the name that is above every name and above every name that is named. As 1 Peter 3.22 says, Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. So I thought that was an interesting um, entry there, um, especially the section about um, the these authorities possessing their authority from primordial times. So basically when God created them, he created them with this rank, but then they rebelled against him. They became evil. And so then they had to be subdued. And this subjugation happened at the death and resurrection of Christ when he uh, rose and he ascended to the right hand of God. And I thought it was also really interesting, the suggestion that they make here that um, why Paul doesn't name them. He doesn't give any names for these beings. He just gives their rank, you know, Archon or uh, Exousia, Cosmocrator, and so forth. And the suggestion here is that their names were withheld because they've been defeated by Christ and he has the name that's above every name. And that he is um, the one who has gone into heaven and seated at the right hand of God and angels, authorities, powers, these things are all subject to him. So I thought that was interesting uh, an interesting suggestion as to why none of these evil beings are given names in, uh, in this passage. So the next one is the Cosmocrator. The cosmic powers over this present darkness is how it's translated in Ephesians 6.12. And this term connotes uh, or the Lord of the world or the world ruler. And it occurs in pagan literature as an epithet for God's rulers and heavenly bodies. Now, the Septuagint does not use the term, and the New Testament, only it only occurs here in Ephesians 6.12. This term is also connected with astrology in the pagan literature. As the DDD points out, the planets are called cosmocrators, not only because of their function as an organizing principle in space, but chiefly because according to astrology, they exercise a fateful influence over man. And we see this sort of thing in various New Age beliefs today. 
Now, there are a couple of interesting lines in the Testament of Solomon that use this word cosmocrater. Um, specifically in chapter 18, verse 12, in which uh, 36 spirits introduce themselves to Solomon with the words, we are the 36 elements, the world rulers of this darkness of this age. And that's the word cosmocrater, the world rulers of the darkness of this age. So again, that's the same term that Paul uses here in Ephesians. And the Dictionary of Deities and Demons goes on to say the battle of the Christians has cosmic dimensions. And we've discussed that um, in, in many places in this uh, series already and in various videos in the channel. But the DDD goes on to point out that Cosmocrotters refers to the demon world governed by the devil. And in Irenaeus, the term has developed into a direct reference to the devil. And I, as Irenaeus sa says, the devil is, one, is the one whom is called Cosmocrotter. So there definitely, as we've gone through that, there definitely seems to be crossover in the literature as to how these terms were used and which entities were identified with each. So it does make it difficult to clearly define the hierarchy, even though it clearly appears that Paul's stating there is one. And I do agree that that is what Paul is communicating here. Um, we just see some, some sloppiness in extra biblical writings when the authors of these other non-biblical, non-inspired texts are using these terms. They're not as crisp as Paul is, and so some of the water is muddied, so to speak, in that, um, in that way. And so it becomes more difficult to clearly define the hierarchy as or understand the hierarchy as Paul has laid it out here. But I do think that's what's being stated, and so it's just some of our understanding because of these non-biblical texts have confused the distinctions a bit. And the last term that Paul uses, the evil spirits, um, I'm actually with the minority view here because most scholars see that term evil spirits also translated sometimes as spiritual armies, as a term that's simply used to further describe the rulers mentioned above. Now, I don't agree with that. I think that this is describing the lowest level in the hierarchy, um, which would be the demons themselves, the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. So as Paul is giving us this hierarchy, and the scholars agree that he is giving a hierarchy, I, I'm not sure why they... When they get to evil spirits, they just say, well, this is a catch-all term for all the, the all the above kind of a thing. I, I don't think so. I think this is the lowest level in the rung, the lowest uh, piece of the hierarchy. So it goes from uh, rulers, authorities, you know, cosmic rulers of the darkness to evil spirits, the demons. And demons are personal malevolent beings. And the essential character of all these beings named by Paul is wickedness. So I do agree with that. And they will, these entities will respond to worship and offerings, but they never work for free. The Dead Sea Scrolls speak of the angel of darkness or the spirit of evil. And he is said to work by malice and lie, pride and arrogance of heart, denial, cheating, and hypocrisy. As Harold Honer points out, the cosmic rulers of darkness are in conflict with the god of light. Now I just want to say right there, that Honer says the cosmic rulers of darkness, um, specifically Paul uses that again for the cosmic rotters. So, uh, but I think, but I think what Honer is using again is more of a catch-all statement that the cosmic rulers of darkness, the entire hierarchy, is in conflict with the god of light, which is clearly, I mean, that's clearly correct. There's no doubt about that. And that's what we see also Paul communicate in Acts 26, 17, and 18 when. Well, he's, Paul is here in this passage quoting what the Lord told him at the start of Paul's ministry. So this is Paul quoting the Lord. So it's really the Lord speaking. He says, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So that's what this battle is about. As this hierarchy of evil, all these rebellious beings, these gods and uh, demonic forces are in conflict with the God of light and the, and the mission 
of Christ, why he came was to destroy the works of the devil. And then he sends, you know, the great commission. He sends the church out to make disciples of all the nations to, as he told Paul, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So in addition to being at war with God and believers, there is also war between these evil gods. And this is pointed out by people who do um, deliverance type ministries. Uh, they'll talk about this. And at this point you might ask, isn't that statement that the, there's war between the rebel gods, isn't that in violation of Matthew 12, 26, in which Jesus said, if Satan is casting out Satan, he is divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. Now, I've thought about this, and um, this part, I mean, this is just my opinion, but I don't think that that's in conflict with the idea of there being war between the gods, the evil gods. Because Jesus specifically said that if Satan casts out Satan, and this means that Satan is not divided in his purposes. Because if he were divided in, in his own purposes, then his kingdom would not survive. But I don't think that necessarily means that Satan wouldn't throw a, a demons under the bus if it, was, if it were to further his own agenda to further deceive and lead people further into darkness. And in the context of Matthew 12 why the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub. In the context of that whole scene, Jesus was bringing complete healing to the possessed man. That man was set free by the ministry of Jesus. And that is what Satan never does. He brings further deception and bondage. Uh, Jesus' statement also doesn't mean... I don't believe that the gods don't war against each other for territory and worship. Again, if that furthers their agenda to enslave humanity, to receive worship, uh, to cause destruction and death of God's image bearers, that's what they're about. So they war against each other in this process, but their ultimate agenda is carried forward. And we see that in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 48 and 49, Jeremiah is um, prophesying against the nations. And as part of the prophecy against Moab, in Jeremiah 48, 7, he says to them, Your god, Chemosh, will go into exile. And in his prophecy of the Ammonites, in 49, 3, he says, For your god, Molech, with his priests and officials, will be hauled off to distant lands. So these are the idea, this idea that Jeremiah is saying here, is the gods of these nations are going to be taken into exile um, as the... Babylonians come in and conquer the territory. So the ancients viewed war as a battle between their gods and the gods of the opposing kingdoms. We see this clearly in the writings of the Assyrians that we, that we discussed in our study of Nahum. So they believed that whichever army won had the stronger gods. So if we try to bring this together here as we finish up this section... We read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 17, it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For all things in heaven and on earth were created by him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers. And there's our terms again that Paul used in Ephesians 6. So, again, back to Colossians, and he says, All things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. So Jesus created everything, yet many of his creatures chose to rebel and wage war against him, both his human creation and his supernatural creation. And he defeated them at the cross and resurrection is now seated at the Father's right hand in the heavenly places. As we discussed in... Uh, the Dictionary of Deities and Demons article um, a few minutes ago. And we are seated in Him. We've mentioned that before in this series as well. So we need to remember this going forward. That we are to see ourselves as fighting from a position of victory since we have already been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. 
So as this war ra uh, rages all around us, as the gods war amongst themselves, and we can see this in you know in the just the religions of the world as all as the pagan the non-christian religions often war with each other um and we see this spiritual mafia behind these uh, human conflicts the book of revelation also makes this clear when it says that uh the three unclean spirits like frogs go out to gather the nations to armageddon um bringing everybody together to this fight, the supernatural war is also carried out in the terrestrial. And again, that's what we're talking about, spiritual warfare. The spiritual war that um, we are all involved in from birth. So as these entities war against each other for worship and power and domination, they're ultimately at war with Christ, and that's Satan's ultimate uh, agenda is to try to defeat God and take his throne. So as all this is going, going on all around us, we need to remember and see ourselves as fighting from a position of victory. As Paul says in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us, because we have been united with him and are seated with him in the heavenly realms, and he has already won this victory. Thank you for listening. I'll be posting the next section of this study in the next video. So if you like the content, be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you won't miss any of this series or any of the upcoming videos. And here, if you look to the screen right now, is the list of sources that I've used in preparing this entire study. I hope you enjoy and are blessed by it. God bless.